some technical problems. No. I can see her. I can see her, but I can't hear her. Okay. Maybe oh, the technicians can, can help us. Message? I haven't got my phone here. What are we going to do? We are talking to her. Okay. Just stay here. Okay, so we can. I can see her, but not hear her. Huh? Same. Okay. Okay. Can you hear me now? Yes. Yes. Mm -hmm. well, nice okay. to see you. Hi. <laughs> nice Hi. to see Hello. you too. Yeah. Fantastic. <laughs> so I was uh, welcoming everyone to this opening session of this week of discussions within the framework of the Time Use Initiative for the for a healthy society, which takes part um, of this uh, initiative of promoting a time use reform um, from Barcelona, but uh, with an international perspective. Uh, it's a great honor and a pleasure to be uh, chairing this interesting opening session between two uh, uh, honor guests, uh, Carl Honoré and Judy Wackman, two uh, very well-known, uh, internationally renowned uh, specialists on, on the topic we're dealing with. Uh, and we think that the, the topic to, today is, is a very timely topic uh, at, at a moment where acceleration and speed seem to have become the, the defining characteristic of contemporary social life even in times of pandemic and lockdowns. So it will be very nice to, to hear you both and, and to promote this, this conversation. Just for those of, of, uh, of those of, uh, who are listening, us, listening to us who don't know you very well, I would like to introduce you a little bit. Um, first of all, uh, we have the honor to have uh, Carl Honoré here, who is a very well-known uh, journalist, one of the pro main promoters of the slow movement and a prolific author, very well-known especially by, uh, for the book uh, In Praise of Slow, which has been translated in many, many, many different languages around the world, including Spanish. And then also Judy Wachman, who is the uh, Anthony Giddens Professor of Sociolo Sociology at the London School of Economics and also a visiting professor at the Oxford Internet Initiative. Uh, she has been working and, and writing extensively about the relationship between technology, time and work for more than 20 and 30 years. And she is notably the author of two very important books on the topic that we're dealing with to, today. Uh, first one is Pressed for Time, Acceleration of Life in Digital Capitalism. And then more recently, she edited a book uh, called The Sociology of Speed. So to start warming up the conversation, I wanted to ask you about the importance of time. Why do we really need to rethink really our time. Uh, why do we really need to, to be discussing about this topic today? Judy, would you like to start? Make three points just to kind of set up the conversation. I mean, I'm a sociologist, and so I'm very interested in how kind of culture, history, social institutions shape our individual and collective uh, experience of time. And what I've been very interested in in the last few years is to think about how a particular view of time became dominant in Western modernity, a view of time in which we think about time in a linear, chronological, quantitative and instrumental way. And it's a view in which time is seen somehow as a resource that needs to be optimised, that needs to be made the most of. We need to be efficient. And, you know, I'm always reminded of the, of the, of the uh, famous sociologist, you know, Max Weber, uh, who, who talked about wasting time as being the worst of sins. You know, this idea that there's a kind of moral force on time discipline, using time um, effectively, and that there is a problem. And it's a moral problem, a cultural problem about, you know, how do we think about wasting time? I mean, I've written a lot about the speed of technology. This is my second point and how technology has exacerbated the problem and has actually meant that expectations of um, speed, acceleration, doing things quickly, um, you know, has fed into our kind of experience of being pressed for time as, as being always short of time, experiences of time poverty, time scarcity. But what I've tried to make clear in my book is that I don't um, that I, I, I don't think it's technology per se that is causing these feelings of acceleration, that it seems to me that this is a kind of cultural, moral, ethical stance in which the technologies come about and, um, 
you know, kind of exaggerate these sort of tendencies. Let me put it that way. And I'm sure we'll come back to the issue of digital technologies. I just thirdly wanted to say very quickly before I hand over to Carl, is that it's very important always in these discussions about time to not universalize and generalize, to stress the fact that different groups of people experience time very differently, that the control over time is very related to the resources uh, people have, the power uh, that people have. And that what I've argued in my work is that having access to time that you can control, that you can spend with your family, friends, leisure, whatever, that having a decent amount of quality time should be thought of now as part of sort of citizenship, as part of social justice, that just as we think that a decent income is part of a decent life, we should think that having control over a decent amount of time is also an aspect of citizenship and the quality of life. Okay, over to Carl. Hi, thanks, Judy. Um, I, I would echo everything that, that Judy has said, and much of my work has also looked at time through the same lens and come to very similar conclusions about linear time and how that creates a, I think, a neurotic, unhealthy relationship with time that we have. I'll, I'll just add two little points to it or add two nuances. One is that it seems to me that the, the natural corollary of this, and Judy touched on it, but I'll go a little deeper on it, is, is speed, right? That the, the, the idea, the, the compulsion, the, the moral terror about failing not to make the most of your time leads us to one place, and that is acceleration. Yeah. So that has been the keynote, it seems to me, at least since the early industrial era, but very much in the last, you know, digital era has taken it to another level. But the idea that faster is always better in every circumstance. And we can go back to the beginning of the industrial era and see that in terms of money, productivity, output, Benjamin Franklin famously saying 250 years ago, time is money. So creating that intimate nexus between speed and a wide use of wise use of time being connected to money and financial gain. But it seems to me that that notion of acceleration as the way to use time best has percolated into every corner of our lives. So even things that really have very little, if not nothing to do with speed end up getting accelerated. So that's why you end up, I mean, not far from where I'm sitting now in my home in London, there is a gym that offers an evening course in speed yoga right? You know, we've, we've reached that stage. And, and I thought speed yoga was ridiculous until a friend of mine in the United States got invited to a drive through right? Like a drive through funeral, you know? So where people literally arrive to say farewell to a loved one from the front seat of their car, right? So it's very fast, but is it a funeral? So I, I think that's kind of how I come at time is through what we do with it. And it seems to me what we do with it is what the futurists told us to do at the beginning of the 20th, 20th century, which is, you know, they, they talked about a new, you know, ex, ex, a transcendent beauty had been born in the world and that was the beauty of speed. And I think that virus of hurry has infected every corner of our lives. One final thing just to throw into the question of time is that it seems to me in the modern world, something else has happened, which is not only has become time become linear, but it has, it has been flattened. So mm -hmm. if you think back through history, if you look at, say, um, the Bible, right, the famously, uh, there was a, what is it, to every, to every thing, there was a season and a time to every purpose under the heaven, yeah. right? Oh, oh, you can find it in Cervantes, right, in Don Quixote as well, que no, que no son todos los tiempos unos, right? The idea in the past that there was a time for each thing, a time to work, a time to rest, a time to eat a time to sleep, a time to love, a time to laugh. And mm. in the modern world, a world obsessed with speed, there is only one time and you are expected almost to do everything at all times. So this is the world of all day breakfasts, of 24 seven shopping, of no limits, no breaks, no guardrails. And I think that has fed into the, the whole sense that we have now that there is never ever enough time. When of course there is just as much time today as there was 400 years ago. <laughs> Every day still has 24 hours in it. It's how we experience it that has, I think, shifted radically in the modern era. 
very interesting point, Carl. And I think I think you both have worked with this idea that speed is intrinsically linked with the idea of, of modernity in a way. And you, you also uh, go back to history and, and see other moments in history in which acceleration has been a, a very defining point, such as the telegraph invention, uh, the modern metropolis, for instance, uh, electricity. Uh, so, but why? Even if we have all this objective data about uh, that this is not an unprecedented acceleration, why do we feel that this is an exceptional, <laughs> unprecedented, unprecedented acceleration moment? I mean, wh what makes it, um, you know, so um, intense? This this feeling of, of of speed and acceleration. What is it unique of this particular moment? I mean, I do think if I can come in here, I do think digital technologies play a huge role. And actually in my class this week, uh, we're discussing self-tracking technologies. And it was something I remember a few years ago, I used to just crack a joke about. And then I asked the students whether any of them were using self-tracking technologies and found that every single student was using a multiple of tracking, whether it was for their productivity, whether it was for their steps, whether it was for calories. I mean, there's no doubt that 24 seven connectivity you know, um, social media, that all of these kind of technologies have colonized, um, you know, space and time in a way that it kind of is unique. So I think, you know, one of the things as, as well that I'm sure we'll get on to talking about, but is about sort of work and family um, blurring, that, it, that in a way I used to a few years ago very much talk about how it was 24 seven um, technologies that meant that people couldn't um, separate anymore. Uh, their home time from their work time and, and things like this. And now we have a shift to many, many people now working um, at home in the physical space that was separate. So I think this blending, uh, you know, merging is a real problem and it's very, it, it makes it much harder. I think these technologies do make it much harder to separate out, um, as Carl said, different activities and the suitability of different kind of tempos for different kinds of activities when all of these digital technologies are all running as quickly as they can. And actually we pay for better and better um, fibers so that the stuff can, can go faster and faster. You know, we absolutely pay and put a, um, a privilege on how quickly we can do things. And actually the technologies ratcheted up, ratchet up our expectations so that when things uh, are a bit, you know, our sense of what's fast keeps um, accelerating itself, I'd say. Yeah, I, I think um, I think there's something else here. It, the technology is part of the equation, and I think I, I agree with what Julie was saying earlier, which is, well, I personally think that the technology is neutral, right? It's just how we use it that's, that, that determines whether it's a good or bad thing. And by and large, I think we're misusing it. Now we're using it in a way that's not good. It's, it's, it's bad. Um, but I think something else has happened in the, certainly in the last maybe, well, certainly post-war or in the last, you know, 20, 30 years is that the world has become, I mean, with turbo consumerism, the world has become this vast buffet, this enormous smorgasbord of things to consume, eat, uh, experience. And, and there's just a sense. And, and that's why the phrase FOMO, you know, in the English phrase FOMO, fear of missing out has gone mainstream in the last few years. There's just a sense that you open your door, you don't even need to open your door, you open your laptop and suddenly you're presented with this infinite array of things that are incredibly tempting. And there's just a sense of limitless possibility. And, and I think that's overwhelming to us, uh, you know, physically, emotionally, probably spiritually, because we as human beings, we were actually built for life and the savanna in Africa, you know, a place of famine, uh, of peace. A la savanna, we're not, we're not built for a world where there's a crispy cream donut stand on every street corner, no right? And we just don't know how to stop. We don't know how to feel not to feel, not to feel overwhelmed by it. So if you think of what happens with food, when we're accustomed to live in a world of, of, of scarcity, you put us in a world of super turbo abundance, and we don't know how to stop eating, which is why obesity is going through the roof. And I think you can see a parallel with, even with social communications, social media, you know, we are social animals, we crave social connection. So that little beep or the little red tick that tells you someone has liked your post is, is like crack cocaine to us, right? And you wouldn't have got that much living in a medieval village or certainly on the you know, plains of sub-Saharan Africa thousands of years ago, you get it all the time now. And we just, 
we struggle to cope, I think, with that. Yes, but can I just say, I mean, I, I kind of completely agree with you, but where as a science and technology studies scholar, I disagree with you, is that I don't think that the technologies are neutral. I mean, a lot of my work is actually about who designs technologies, who makes decisions um, over them, um, what values get embedded in them. And the fact that, you know, there are these likes and that, you know, you watch a video and immediately the next video comes on. You know, this whole discussion at the moment about digital addiction. I mean, you know, I'm, I've got problems with the word addiction being used for what's going on. But the fact that, you know, psychologists, behavioural scientists and psychologists sit in Silicon Valley working out how to keep us online as if, you know, like gambling addiction, like, you know, that there's a huge amount of money going into designing technologies that maximize that feeling. That's all I'm saying. Yes, but yeah. absolutely we experience it like that, but we're supposed to, yeah. Yeah, no, and I- they when, could when, be, And they could be designed differently, you know. Sorry, yeah, I just wanted to add that, Judith. Sorry, I didn't mean to. Yes, no, no, I, I, I was expecting you to say these, in fact. <laughs> just let me just, just let me clarify. Let me clarify what I'm saying. When I say that the, the technology is neutral, I'm talking about, you know, the delivery of broadband or the number of pixels on a screen. Everything else that gets laid on that, how social media is constructed, all of the, the you know, psych psychological industrial complex you describe as Silicon Valley, that is layering on, of course, value judgments, many of them, I think, toxic. And that's not neutral at all. I'm talking about the gadgets themselves. It's what we, the, the cultural in my view, the cultural edifice we built on top of it. And I think that's where we're going, I think that's where we're going badly wrong at the moment. Is it, could, could we, could, would, would you say that uh, we could say that time is, is that space where everything uh, intersects, like politics, finance, ecology, um, social life, um, why is why, why is time so central in our lives? I mean, I, I mean, um, what are the key issues at stake um, with, with time? I mean, wh wh why it's, it's so important in our lives and both individually and, and, and collective life? Well, it's hard for me to, do you want to go first, Carl? You go, you go ahead, go ahead, Judy. Yeah, I'll sorry, yes, it's, it's kind of <laughs> hard when we're not physically in each other's presence. <laughs> yeah, yeah, <laughs> I mean, I must say, you know, one of, you know, this is sort of slightly tangential, but again, you know, I think about a lot, is that I, is that democracy takes a lot of time, right? To have deliberative democracy, to have citizens um, having time to reflect on what sort of society they want, what sort of the technology they want. You know, these are really sort of time issues. It seems to me, you know, time is incredibly political. And that we live in this era where, um, as Carl was saying, you know, speed, you know, there's such an emphasis on speed, on making decisions um, as quickly as possible. You know, we're told by politicians that we're all always in extraordinary circumstances where we have to take shortcuts, make decisions quickly. And in Silicon Valley, the discourse is that if we don't, um, you know, maximize the research and development, all these technologies, then China will get ahead of us. You know, there's all these sort of different stories, all of which are going against the notion that we need time to kind of reflect, deliberate, discuss and make decisions. So that there's a, I, you know, I, th I think time is at the center of kind of a, a sped up politics in that sense, that's, that's very negative. Yeah, I mean, I, I would second that definitely. I, I think the time is a, it's just an element that's part of everything we do. Uh, we may be sometimes very aware of it, other times not at all. We may be aware of it after the fact, looking back as we process a memory or an experience and think of how long it took and what that meant. So I think it's one of the, the layers or the lenses we bring to all forms of human experience in the same way as I would put beauty in that or aesthetics. You know, that's something that's part of everything we do as well. So I think I think time is just like a kind of, in my view, is kind of a sort of light motif that is 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 woven through, pretty much every form of of, of human experience. Mm. And talking about democracy and and politics, how much do you do you think uh, the speed of of social networks are kind of influencing the kind of politics that we see emerging a little bit everywhere in the world? No, with, with with all these politicians using Twitter and, and Facebook and Instagram as a way of connecting immediately with, the, with their audiences and, and, and electorates, um, but by, uh, you know, kind of um, forgetting this, this kind of slow, um, deliberative process that every single democracy needs. I, I'm, I find this the most worrying and alarming 
cultural trend of the moment actually is the hyper speed of of information, especially in the political social arena. Yeah. And I think we're seeing it playing out in real time in the United States with the election and so on and all the aftermath and fallout from that. But I, I'm, I speak as a journalist, right? So I'm someone who you know, has a great sacred admiration for the importance of media and informing. And I feel very, I mean, I'm deeply alarmed by what's happened in my own world of journalism in the last 10 years. That it, It's so much more important now in that world to be first. It's more important to be first than to be right. And it's more important to inform um, or to notify rather than to inform. And I think this is creating a situation where people are very easily manipulated, distracted, unable to understand what's going on, even, unable even to identify their own best interests, because they are essentially, I think, being manipulated often. And there's an old phrase, you know, that the, um, a lie will get all the way around the world or halfway around the world before the truth gets its 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 shoes on. And we're yeah. seeing that so clearly now that disinformation, um, I, I don't like the phrase fake news because I think that's very loaded. And, and so I won't I'm gonna push that to one side, but just falsehood, lies and misinformation and propaganda. Have, it seems to me have, I mean, even in the last, I would say two or three years have really gained the upper hand. And I, I, I think it's a frightening prospect for how it can corrode our not only democracy and how that works but all of our social interactions our culture everything and I think that that's when I first when I first wrote you know began writing about slow and the in praise of slow and all that I, I didn't see politics as being that much of a problem or I saw it of course you know politicians then and now were worried about the next press conference and thinking maybe short term in terms of the next election cycle but that has sped up so much now. And I, at first in my work was focusing more on the business world and regarding that as the world that was more resistant to the idea of slowing down. I think it's the opposite now. I think it's politics where it's speed is doing far more damage and is far more poisonous now, it seems to me, than if I had to compare it than, than in the business world. But I mean, this if I could just add to that, this really um, brings us to the issue of, of kind of state regulation, actually, because amongst, again, you know, media scholars and technology scholars, there is, a, you know, a, a, a big discussion at the moment on what's called content moderation, right? And, you know, we know that, you know, Facebook sets up its own regulatory um, board that's going to oversee content moderation, right? Now, you'd have to be crazy to think that self-regulation of these big media companies is going to solve this problem. And I really, you know, and I think there's going to be a lot of energy in, in the next few years, and I couldn't agree more with Carl about, you know, how are we going to kind of, what are we going to do about these big companies? And are we going to intervene um, in terms of content and start curating content in the, in you know, in some ways that maybe will be parallel or different to kind of traditional media. But I, I do think it's a huge area, um, important area for democracy. I couldn't agree more, actually. But it's, again, an issue about how much power is concentrated in mm. these kind of few companies, how anti-competitive they are. That's the extraordinary thing that, you know, kind of it's supposed to be that's free market stuff. And whenever there's competition, they, they quickly buy it up. So there is no competition. And we really need a more genuinely kind of competitive environment and some regulation. And I think Europe is going to be the centre of those discussions, much more than the US even under Biden, it seems to me. Yeah, I think it's true that anytime you end up, as we are now with big tech in the tech world, in a Wild West scenario, yeah. the Wild West always ends up as a monopolistic dystopia, right? We've been here before with robber yeah. barons at the late 19th century. We're in the same place now. It's more dangerous because it affects, I mean, this is poisoning the cultural social bloodstream. And, and we need, I think we need to move on this swiftly and move on it hard. I don't know exactly what it looks like, but as you say, I think you're gonna, we're gonna find the lead in Europe. Just one little mm -hmm. data point example, you know, was it 2016, France brought out that law giving citizens the right uh, to switch off their phones away from the office, not to be reachable. Um, you know, in, in some ways a small step, but in others, an epic one, right? A, a putting a line in the sand and saying up into here and no further. So, you know, I, I think the government states probably at international level are going to have to step in. I don't know exactly what shape that will take, but um, it has to, we can't, we can't leave it. The free market is broken, clearly, <laughs> on this one. 
I want I wanted to also raise the question of gender here because when we talk about time use, um, there's always this uh, gender imbalance uh, questions. And, and having written this book about techno feminism, uh, Judy, I wanted uh, I cannot resist to, to raise this question too because uh, with the time use reform promoted from from Catalonia, um, there is these statistics that say uh, that uh, every um, for every man that works part time. There are 26 uh, women that uh, who work part time, um, so it's not it's not a voluntary. I mean, they're clearly and uh, in in the organization of time, there are clearly gender um, um, imbalances. Could you please raise uh, something about some points about this this topic? Well, yes, sure. I mean, I think that's being so um, intensified during this COVID phase. I mean, there's been, there are a lot of feminists now um, writing about how disproportionately uh, these lockdowns have affected men and women within the household, that the kind of massive homeschooling, for example, the massive shift to people spending so much time at home um, is absolutely visible in statistics that show that many more women have had to give up paid employment uh, to school their children, um, that, you know, many more women are, yeah, are kind of, uh, are losing their jobs and are doing a phenomenal amount of ad paid care work. So that you get this, that you know, on the one hand, you know, the hospitals, as we know, um, uh, disproportionately, you know, employ female staff that are doing sort of huge amounts of work in the kind of, um, you know, to look after people in, who are ill. And on the other hand, uh, within the domestic sphere that's going on, I mean, I've spoken to friends who've said, and I kind of agree on my optimistic days, that perhaps out of this will come a more uh, equal division of household labour, that, you know, it is possible, given that, you know, a sector of the population is spending more time at home, that men will participate more in all sorts of kind of domestic work and care work um, than they did before. But, you know, from what I see, um, you know, this issue of who's spending time doing what in the household seems to have been kind of made worse uh, during this period of time, I have to say. I think um, in a way what we're coming to here is the, the crux or the nub of this question, which Judy touched on very eloquently in her introduction, using that word power, because like so much of what our experience of time comes down to is power, who holds the power. And if you have power or control over your own time, then that's the game changer, right? And it's people who don't have power, who tend to have very little control over their times. So you think of gig workers, right? Who are just, you know, have got so little control over their time that they are peeing in plastic bottles in their cars, right? Or Amazon fulfillment center workers whose toilet breaks are timed down to the last second. You know, th those are the people at the bottom of the temporal food chain, right? And, and what happens? They've got no control over their time. So yeah. I think a big part of any discussion about reconnecting with our inner tortoise, finding the right tempo, making the most and a more healthy use of time has to attack and contend with these unequal power structures. And, and the male female thing is maps onto that perfectly because you know even though we've had however many decades of feminism, I mean, men and not just in Spain, Catalonia, no, men everywhere are not pulling their weight, right? Um, so, so this is gonna be part of what we have to unpick when we try to give people more control over their time, we go along with that means giving them more power. And that's, again, that's a frightening thing in a society that's still in a lot of ways unequal and hierarchical. And, and if I could just add to that, I mean, one of the main um, points I try and make is that this is about how we value care, both care that's paid, as I said, like in, you know, mm -hmm. in, in hospitals in the service sector, and unpaid care. And I mean, I just heard a discussion this morning, actually, um, on Women's Hour on BBC Radio, where they were talking about how the economy is going to be reboosted after this terror. You know, how are we going to get out of where we are? Where, what, would, what should we invest in to get the economy going? And the standard thing, which we're hearing here, but it's the case everywhere, is the government talking about putting money into traditional infrastructure, right? It's always construction building, i.e. men's jobs, where the focus is. And feminist economists have done terrifically good work showing that actually if a lot of the investment was put into care work, into teachers, hospitals, it would create more jobs, actually. It would be better for the economy. And, you know, it would put a different value on the kind of society we want. So I think this feminist issue goes right through um, to even how we think of the economy and what it should look like in the future. 
Can I can I just throw in one final thought mm -hmm. on the whole kind of male female dynamic? Yes. And this is just a almost anecdotal, but it's just a, a little extra touch to what's happened because of this COVID lockdown. Uh, one thing you're, you, you, I mean, I've seen a lot of reports in the press, but you also hear this anecdotally, is that it's changed, changed of course, how dating apps work, Tinder, because people uh -huh. can't meet in, people can't meet face yeah. to face. They're forced to take, to slow down, right? They're forced to take longer, to chat over Zoom, to have dinner with that. And it's, it's interesting to hear for how many women say, this is actually pretty wonderful. You know, I feel like I've got more control back over the dynamic, the, the the speed, the rhythm of courtship because courtship has been forced to slow down in the pre-COVID world. You know, mm -hmm. you know, men, women, whoever it would be on an app and there'd be pressure to, you know, a few messages, pressure to meet up, maybe have, you know, a sexual encounter right away. Now there is something a little bit more courtly, a little bit more stately, a little slower. And guess who is liking that more? It tends to be women in general. So maybe there's a little silver lining here that it's part of this COVID slowdown is, is recasting the yeah. courtship tempo. And maybe, I'm not saying that only women are gonna prefer that, but, but all of us, uh, perhaps maybe especially women will, will come out with a bit more power and a bit more joy at the end of that. No, oh. no. <laughs> <laughs> I would like to suggest that we spend the last uh, 10 minutes that we have to speak about the future, um, uh, both uh, to reflect upon this idea of the, of the, um, of the fourth industrial um, revolution, when we think about robotics, uh, uh, artificial intelligence, uh, that are already here. It's not, it's not something <laughs> about, uh, about the future future, but something that is already in the present. Uh, could you please say a word about how you imagine that these this new uh, advanced technologies will have an impact in, in the time organization, social organization? Um, well, Judith, you won't be surprised by anything I say in terms of this. I mean, I've been a great campaigner um, for having more diverse groups involved in technological design, you know, women and other groups. I mean, unless we have a broader, uh, you know, a, bro a broader representation of people designing technologies, you know, we're not going to have a broader set of values actually embedded in them. And, and you know, there's a lot of, I think, very exaggerated discourse about uh, what um, advanced technologies will bring. Um, as I'm sure you all know, there's, there's, you know, robotics and digital assistants are just ripe with old um, gender stereotypes in the kind of worst kinds of ways. But I, I think kind of more profoundly, it seems to me that if you contrast the amount of energy um, in Silicon Valley that is put into apps, you know, social media, you know, various kinds of technologies for marketing, basically, and you think, well, actually, what if we reconfigured research and development away from military, away from these things, towards a set of technologies that would really improve the quality of our lives. Like we need a real kind of shift in how we think about um, technological development, it seems to me, and not just to be kind of mystified by this notion that the, as Carl said, the fastest, but it's also, I would add, that the most automated is seen as the best, right? And it's not always the best, that actually, if you think about robotics in care homes, what you, what you want is not the most automated. You want to have technologies that actually fit with what people in care homes want, what workers in care homes want. So there's all kinds of ways in which one might think of a much better relationship uh, between technologies and people who use them than this um, constant uh, push for automation. Yeah, I mean, I, well, I was going to say something else, but you mentioned ro ro robots yeah. in, in um, nursing homes. Uh, I... I, I was working and uh, doing some research in a nursing and a you know old what are we calling third age home in um, yeah. in Holland a couple of years ago and they had introduced a robot to talk to the residents and they were finding that the residents were sharing more intimate secrets and stories about their lives with the robot than they were actually with people who you know human beings even their own family members so it was just a a reminder that the whole kind of question of robot and AI is. In my view, anyway, it's not always all bad, all good, all black, all white. It's going to be very gray, lots of nuance. And, and, and so much of it is going to come down to what you said earlier, which is how we design, you know, what we put into the recipe. We've got to make sure we don't fall into the old biases, the old prejudices. We've got to, you know, open our minds up and rethink how we design all of these algorithms and pieces of equipment that are going to be part of our lives more and more as we, 
as we move along. So that would be my first thought. The second thought is um, there's certainly a lot of, you know, I would consider some of it hot air, but a lot of talk about how AI and so on is going to create a take away all our jobs and so on. And I suppose if it does that, then you know, maybe it's game over, or maybe we just become a society of leisure, and then then hopefully we will then we will have to use slow and use it wisely. I suspect it's going to be a more mixed picture. Uh, if it does take away many of our jobs, it's not, I don't think, at least not yet, going to be good at the creativity side of things, right? And probably not still, even despite that robot in the Dutch um, old person's home, we're still going to be better at the social interaction. So both of which require slowness, right? Creativity, creative thinking, and social connection. So it may be that sitting at the poker table of the future, we just have to put our chips as humanity down on that side of the table, which is the creative stuff, the, um, the so and 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 let the, the rest of it go. Um, I mean, these are science fiction parlor games, right? I don't have a crystal ball, but uh, I, I'm a na I'm a natural optimist, and I do think that we will find a way to, at least I hope we will find a way to get, make the most of these things without um, turning into some sort of awful dystopia. It's so good to have an optimistic note, and I would like to uh, raise a final question since we're it's 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 being uh, very interesting, but also very fast. So we're almost yeah. out of time. Um, I wanted to ask you another question about about the future and about this post-pandemic society, and then to what extent do you think this this pandemic will help us have more rational time users and more time organization? Uh, to to what extent this. Uh, post-pandemic society will be a slower society? And to what extent uh, can we still think about the future at a moment where uh, everything seems to be denying a future, not a climate change, um, you know, this idea of, of, of the, 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 the economic crisis that is coming, um, everything, no? So that uh, this both, both the idea of, of the future it, itself, but also about um, hoping for some uh, big changes, good uh, changes that the pandemic might bring. Mm. I mean, I have to say sort of one thing that has made me optimistic is that there's been much more discussion in Britain about what's called key workers, right? That there does seem to have been, a, you know, a kind of profound shift actually in terms of what work is seen as the best work, the peak work, the most valued work. And I mean, even though, you know, I've um, got a lot of problems with the current British government, I mean, it has really forced a discussion about who are the key workers essential for running society and who aren't, you know what I mean? That actually maybe being in finance, being a, a trader isn't as important as being a nurse. And, you know, I hope that, that we can hang on to that because that then is, is, is kind of setting out an agenda for kind of revaluing what activities uh, we value and what activities we don't and maybe might kind of register in thinking about a different kind of future. I mean, I guess the other thing I would say is that a lot of what the kind of dynamic of, of the Silicon Valley has always been that we can predict the future, that these technologies are great at prediction and we can predict the future and make for the future. And I mean, I think this has been a kind of moment to step back and think, actually, um, you know, we, these you know, however good these technologies are, they haven't been able to do that and that we need to really sort of think about what sort of society we want to live in kind of now. Um, and make the most of what we've got now, you know. Um, anyway, sounds a bit trite, but I'll leave it to Carl. You, you tell us another thing to end with. All right. <laughs> um, I think there are a few, just a few quick things. Yeah. One, you know, we, we spent a lot of time in quiet cities. We could hear birds singing. Yes, yes we could absolutely. Smell, yeah. We could smell the trees. And I think yeah. at a moment when the world needs a global climate reset, yeah. that's going to be useful for that discussion. Number two, slower forms of transport. I mean, across Europe, I think that we've opened up a thousand kilometers more of cycle lanes. You know, people yeah. are going to move through the urban landscape more slowly at a human pace. That's not going to change. We've got that. We can build on it. It will go forward. And then lastly, people have, thanks th through the pandemic, being stuck at home, obviously a lot of bad sides to that, but many people have had, coming back to this idea of control, have regained control over their time. You know, when they work, uh, you know, maybe they're good at the creative stuff in the morning. They can focus on, because they don't have people hovering over them, checking up on them every couple of seconds, or even being the same physical space. So that's not everybody's experience, but enough people I think are finding that they enjoy having that control over their time, not wasting hours commuting, that now that even it's okay to go back to the office, many people are saying, 
no, I'll go back maybe once a week or twice a week and stuff. So I think out of that miasma of change, you, I can think you can start to see the silhouette of something more hopeful in, in, in lots of different ways. Okay, many, many thanks for these yeah, very interesting remarks. Uh, I think we've, uh, you, you fit it, uh, fed, uh, with a lot of um, um, uh, interesting ideas that, that are hopefully, hopefully will, will be uh, continued and discussed uh, in the whole week of this time uh, use uh, week that is being promoted here from Barcelona. And I thank you both for, for your availability, for, for these interesting remarks, for the conversation, lively conversation. And I wish uh, the Time Use Week a, a very lively uh, discussions all week and, and, and wish you all the best. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank it was you. a pleasure. Thank you. Thank you. Pleasure. The same.